can remain standing at our head just a moment in the presence of God, our kind Heavenly Father, it is indeed with grateful hearts that we bow in thy presence to offer to thee the very adoration of our hearts, to tell thee our, our appreciation of thy love and kindness to us, and to express that we are unworthy of the blessings that thou would bestow upon us. And I pray thee, Heavenly Father, to be merciful to us tonight, to give unto us of thy grace and blessings. Bless the people, heal the sick and the needy, and save the love. For we ask it in the name of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Be seated. <clears throat> We are very happy to be in tonight. Just a little bit hoarse from over-speaking for many services and from place to place. But it always gives us a, a great thrill in our hearts to speak of the blessed Lord Jesus and his goodness. And we have the rest of this week, the Lord willing, and we want to speak very definitely for the rest of the week, if God will just help me now to have a little voice, upon the coming of the Lord Jesus in the preparation of his church before the end now. So tonight, I just want to speak to you for a short time. And then pray for the sick and the needy. And one night, perhaps maybe tomorrow night or one night following, we are going to try by the help of the Lord to have one of the old-fashioned nights. I don't mean a, a fast line, as we call it, but a line where we can take the individuals and pray for them individually without discernment. Just pray for the people. We had one of those nights not long ago up in Lima, Ohio. And oh, how the Lord did honor them for all the sick. And the great things that our Lord Jesus did. Now, I am trying to get the people to believe God on a higher base than that, to accept Him without having anyone touch Him. It's you touching Him. You see, if, if I would put my hands on you and pray for you, it seems like then you could say, Brother Branham laid his hands on me. But that ain't the idea. I want you to be able to say, no one touched me but him. I, I, that's what I want to see this. Give him the praise. And there's so much man-made praise today till it's all right pitiful, isn't it? And the other night when the little Indian child was healed coming up to the platform, no one touched it, just healed. Cross eyes. You still look at it yourself. Now that's where I like to see it happen. Just like that. That shows that no one prayed, no one did nothing but God in His sovereign grace to heal the child. That's good. God gets the praise. In it. I like it, my friend. Brother Stockman, are you about to burn up down here in Phoenix after coming from that iceberg of Canada? <laughs> Brother. Fred Stockman, my Canadian manager. If someone wants to see someone who really lives up where it's cold, don't want to embarrass you, Brother Fred, but would you just stand up a moment? Brother Fred Stockman from Saskatchewan, Canada. Lord bless you, Brother Fred Stockman. He is the best fisherman in Canada when I'm in the United States. 
<laughs> We're fixing to have another meeting up there right away now. Comes up in May. We're going to Canada, the Lord willing. And we're having some great times up in Canada with those fine people. Sure got a beautiful place down here, all heaven. Yes, sir. Now I wish to read for a moment and then try to finish up and start the prayer line at nine o'clock. I want to read a familiar old text which seems to be on my heart tonight out of the third chapter of St. John, and it's the sixteenth verse, which most any child in the audience tonight that's had any training of the Bible could quote this text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And for a subject, I would like to take a very strange one, and that is divine love. The Bible says that God so loved the world of divine love, and when divine love is projected to its object, Father's grace steps in and produces what it projected. God does things in such simple ways. I think many times that's how people lose the very meaning. It's because that God does things so simple. Men are looking for some great some great things that take place when God dwells in simplicity. When Jesus came on the earth, men were looking for him aside to come in great splendor. But when God sent his son to the earth, he sent him, not born in some royal king's family, and neither did he bring him to some great religious order, but he visited a little peasant girl, and he chose to bring his son to that child, no more than a little teenage girl. Not only that, but usually when a king is born, there is great singing among the people, and there is the celebrity of the world is looking, or uh, that nation, for this child to be born. And there is usual a special preparation for this child. The hospital room is all decorated in peace and so forth. The very best of doctors are brought standing by. But the strange thing is God brought his son to the earth to this little virgin. She had been riding all day on the back of a donkey. And there was no room for at the hotel. And God so chose it that his only begotten son was born in a stable, in a manger. How simple God does things. That sometimes is to confuse the mind of the wise and prudent, so that babes will have a chance to know. And if God down through the age has done thus, and many times, what he does seems to be ridiculous in the sight of the world. God can do some of the most ridiculous things in the eyes of the world. 
One time in the Bible, when a young man by the name of Moses had been very well trained in all the strategies of the mightiest nation in the world, a great military man, and had been taught with one of the best teachers that could be taught in religion, his mama. Forty years of experience. And with all of his techniques and all of his strategies, he failed to do the job. And then God took him on the back side of the desert and there kept him for 40 years. And one day God come down in a little burning bush and Moses knowed more about what he was to do in five minutes in the presence of God and all of his Egyptian astronomy had taught him in 40 years. All of his training never competed with that great moment in the presence of God. And God was going to deliver his children. It seemingly that he had brought the boy up to have his foot on the throne, to take the great Egyptian army and liberate his people. Sensibly speaking, the way the world counts it, that would have been the way to do it. But God did it in a simple way. Now could you imagine the next day after God had appeared to Moses, who was hiding from the Egyptians, and if you want to see something that looks ridiculous in the eyes of man, look at this sight. Here comes an old man, 80 years old, the whiskers hanging down to his waistline, a little old stick in his hand, and the hair and whiskers blowing every way, little old skinny arm beating his stick on the ground as he goes, leading a little old mule with his wife set the saddle with the young and on each hip, going down to Egypt to take over. Could you imagine that? <laughs> Could you imagine someone saying, Moses, where are you going? I'm going down to Egypt to take over. That would be like a one-man invasion. But the thing of it was, he don't. No matter how simple it seemed, God was behind the program. That's the main thing. Could you imagine a man standing surrounded by a thousand Philistines with armors and spears as Samson stood and picked up the jawbone of a mule and slayed a thousand? God does things so simple. Could you imagine a great army on one side of the hill, a great army on the other side of the hill, and the army on the opposite side of the Philistines, versus Israel, but so many more. And they had a challenger over there by the name of Goliath. He was many times bigger than any other man. And he was making this challenge. And all Israel, with all their trees, was scared of him. And God chose a little old ruddy, ruddy looking guy by the name of David with a little sheepskin coat on him and a slingshot packet in his hand to slay that giant and take over. God uses simple things that seems ridiculous in the sight of the world. He does that to show his great power. God did the same thing when he sent his son to the earth, born in a manger, come to the world with a black name to begin with, as an illegitimate child. But he produced one of the greatest shocks this world has ever had. And on the day of Pentecost, God had 120 illiterate fishermen and peasants in an upper room to a 
inaugurate the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, but he had them completely under control. Went in the city where men from all over the world, with great education and philosophers, teachers, theologians, but God chose a bunch of little humble fishers. And he condemned the world. And sent forth the liberation to all the world with this bunch of little humble fishermen. And then would it seem to you great for God in this last day when we've got all kinds of schools of theology, when we got all kinds of denominations, all kinds of religions, would it seem too great for God that he could take a bunch of humble people, us ordinary people, and once get them under his control, could he not repeat again the blessings of Pentecost? Could he not repeat again the very life that he lived on the earth? The Bible said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, God loved to the world, and God is love. And when God projected himself to the world to save the world, there could be nothing else but sovereign grace to produce a Savior. When God loves, something has to operate. And God so loved the world that a divine Savior appeared. His grace provided that Savior. It was because of His love that brought forth this Savior. Now, in the day that we're living, and in all days, we were born to be sons and daughters of God. We are offspring of God. And being offsprings of God, there's something about us that believes God. There's something in you that calls out for something. And today, to satisfy that longing in our hearts, Many times we try to satisfy it with education. We try to satisfy it with denomination. We try to satisfy it with the fantastic. We try to satisfy it with one thing and another. But it will never take place until divine love in our hearts is projected to Almighty God. Then when our love goes out to His cause, sovereign grace will produce what we are asking for. First, it must be love. Paul said, So I speak with tongues as man and angels, and I have not love, I am nothing. Though so I have faith to move mountains, and have not love, I am nothing. So I can do all kinds of miracles, produce all kinds of signs. And have not love, I am nothing. That's the reason today we are trying to produce something by a nomination, by an education, by an organization that's leading out divine love. That's the reason we're so separated, so many things wrong, so many isms going on, is because it's left the main thing that produces what we need out. Love. Do you remember my sermon Sunday? The little mainspring in the middle of the watch, time that watch to everything. And when God is love, and love moves into our hearts, it times every emotion and everything right with God's Bible. You don't want to show the people what a fine crystal you got, what a fine face it's got, what fine hands it's got, what fine rubies it's got, but what a wonderful timepiece 
of the earth. And the world is sick and tired looking at great big spies, looking at fine dressed people, looking at a bunch of ism. It wants to see the genuine love of God protected in the hearts of his people. That's what the world's looking for. The world is dying for love. The church is dying for love. Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savior, it is his first good for nothing but to be trod under the feet of man. And if the church has lost its divine revelation of the love of God, it becomes a moth and a salt and a stumbling block to the world. Now, there's only one thing the church has to do. If you want somebody to come to Christ, you be salty, salt make the thirst. You be salty and the world will get thirsty. That's right. For in a man, he is in one sense a miniature creator. If he is a child of God, because the Spirit of God is in him, who controls him, who operates him. And I'd like to let you in just on a few things that I know to be the truth. If I had just a little more voice, I'd like to preach on that tonight. But I'd like to let you in on some things. That's this. What divine love, now listen, Paul said, where there's tongues they shall speak, where there's prophecies it'll fail, where there's all these signs, the Antichrist can produce any sign that's in the Bible. But he cannot love. There's nothing about him to love. Or you can have some kind of a false love. There is two kinds of love. There is a love which is called human love, or in the Greek word it would be called filio. And in the divine love is agapo. Agapo love is divine love. And when divine love is in your heart, there's a difference in your life that everybody knows it. Right. You live like a Christian, act like a Christian, walk like a Christian, and your whole system is tied to God's Bible. Now, here's some time ago, my wife was in the building somewhere tonight, I the day had been real dull, and we'd had much of carrying on, people upstairs, downstairs, everywhere else. And as I finally got everybody out along towards night, I went into the kitchen, and there stood my poor little wife with her head buried in her hands and a crying. There was Sarah and Rebecca fighting on the floor because of some blocks. Little Joseph was screaming to the top of his voice. You talk about home, sweet home. There they were. And when I come in, I put my arm around the little first lady of my home, and only one. And I said to her, sweetheart, what is the matter? And she said, Bill, I'm just about to go crazy. She said, these kitties all day long haven't had a bite to eat. People standing around and around and around and different of them, arguing the Lord's going to take you down here, the Lord's going over here. But oh, it's such a confusion. Well, I see right then there was something on going wrong. Now, if you really love God, now you know there's some kind of people that's real good people, only you just can't hardly stand to be around. Why is it? They create that atmosphere. And there's some kind of people that you just love to be around. They create 
create that atmosphere that they live in. Now, it's a supernatural thing. Now, when the presence of the Lord comes down, it creates an atmosphere for faith. And when I thought, now, Lord God, you help me. And I said, sweetheart, you know what? She's just a woman, you know, and she likes pretty dresses and, you know, and pocketbooks. She don't get them all the time, but uh, she likes them. So I said, you know, I saw one of the prettiest dresses I ever saw. She said, you did? I said, yes, honey, I did. And I thought, Lord, God help me. And I laid my hand over on her little stooped shoulder. And I said, honey, you should see it. She said, yes. I said, Lord, you should tell me now. Help me. I said, I've got to believe that you're going to do this. This is my little family. And these six people got them all upset. But you'll help me. Now you've got to create an atmosphere. And your faith will do it. They were all in the upper room with one accord. When suddenly there came from heaven as a sound of a rushing mighty wind. The atmosphere was right. It takes the atmosphere to do anything. You know the regular procedure to have chickens is to put them under the hen. But get the egg in the right atmosphere, it'll hatch anyhow. Listen, brother, if a man loves God and the right kind of an atmosphere he can get into, it'll produce a newborn babe just as certain as I am here. It's the atmosphere that counts. Let this little handful of people sitting here tonight get in the perfect atmosphere. Watch what takes place. There will not be a feeble man that one in our midst. The cripples will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dumb will speak without prayer or anything. It's the atmosphere. That's how 25,000 appealed at one prayer in Africa. When they seen the Lord do something, he created an atmosphere and they stepped into it. That's the pool and the water is just running right. So I had my hand on her little shoulder and I began to try to create in my heart. Lord, I'm happy. There's nothing wrong with me. I love you. You know I do. And you just straighten out my little family. And after a while, I said, tell you what, honey, I'll show you where those dresses are. Then I'll, let's get the kiddies a little bite of supper, and then we'll start. And the first thing, I've got my apron and tied it around me, and I got to helping her and talking about something else. When she got quiet, I looked down and said, and Becky had signed the peace treaty. And they were playing, and little Joseph was just shaking his little rattle box and having a good time. You see, you've got to get in the right kind of an atmosphere. Brother Lindsay, many of you know him, the editor of the uh, Voice of Healing, and we've been associated together much in the past ten years of our lives. We were at Portland, Oregon one night, and many of you read the story of a maniac who run out to kill me on the platform. And just as this great big, almost 300-pound giant. I weighed at that time 128, and he was close to seven foot, gray, big, huge arms, and he comes stomping down to the building while I was preaching on faith before about 6,000 people, rushed up to the platform and preachers scattered like flies. And I wondered what was the matter. I thought there might have been someone coming to bring a message to some of the ministers. And I turned to look, and this great big giant standing there with his chest swelled out, 
and groaning in his teeth gently died. He said, you hypocrite, up there acting as the man of God said, I'll break every bone in your body tonight. I'm going to knock you plumb out in the middle of that audience to show you whether you're a man of God. Little did I know that he was out of the insane institution. And I knew by his size he was very able to carry out his threats. So I looked at him. Ordinarily, I would have talked off with the rest of them. But you know what happened? Oh, if I could only always stay in that. Something instead of hating the man, I felt sorry for him. I thought that man wouldn't want to hurt me. Why, he's a man like I am. And that's got to be the devil making that man do that way. So the poor mother, and he rushed up towards me, and he walked down and he took me it right in the face. And see, the devil was trying to get me to shake away from that atmosphere that God was getting me in. But it didn't bother me. I was all poor fellow. He don't want to do that. And truly, he wouldn't have wanted to do it. And he said, I'm going to break every bone in your body. And he drew back his big fist to do so. And the strange thing was, I wasn't no more afraid than I am right now. Love cast out fear. Perfect love. There's where, brother, sister, our differences hang tonight. Because of love, the lack of love. I don't mean earthly love, denominational love, sexually love, but I mean divine love that makes us brothers. Then, when the man started to hit me, I heard my own lips say, because you have challenged the Spirit of God, tonight you'll fall over my feet. He said, I'll show you whose feet I'll fall over. And he threw back his fist and hit me. And when he did, I said, Satan, leave that man. And his eyes bulged way out. His teeth set. His hands went up. He swung around and fell over my feet to the police. He said, roll him off of my feet. What did it? Love. The love of God. I don't know how much you're going to believe this, but here about two years ago, maybe it was, I was I got a great big ninety foot front yard going to the parsonage there. Now it's hard to get anybody to help you in Indiana because everybody works. Now I'd have to get out and mow the grass. Now I was mowing the grass to make about two rounds when somebody would come in and the front would go up before we got to the bank. So I got around in behind the house on a hot August afternoon, and I had on a pair of overalls and sit this tight. No one was around. It was awfully hot, my shirt was sweaty and dripping on my back, so I just stuck the thing off. Started mowing the yard, back in the backyard. And down to the house, going just as hard as I could, and I forgot that there was a big nest of hornets down at the end of the road. And I rammed this mower right into that fence before the thing came, and I was covered all over with hornets. You know what they are, they kill you. Great big fella. And now, usually, I would have grabbed and started fighting at him and running. I know this seems childish. It may seem not even sensible, but it is the truth. Instead of being afraid of those things, I thought, poor little creatures, I 
disturbs you. And instead of hating them, there was a sympathy in my heart for them. I wished I could have that all the time. If it would, I'd be a different person. And the harness is all around me. But I begin to think, you know what? They are little creatures that have been created by God. And they have a right to live in their house. They have no intelligence to reason like I do. And I run the snow in there, and the only protection they have is their stingers to get me out of the way. Look at it sensible. So I goes all around me, and I stop, and here's the truth. You may not think that I'm very intelligent, but I'm not, Elsa did, but this is true. I said to those little hornets, I said, you little creatures of God, I am the servant of God. And I'm in a hurry. His sick children are coming and going. And I disturbed you, and I'm sorry that I did it. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Creator, go back into your house. I won't bother you anymore. And brother, sister, when I meet you at the judgment bar, them hornets all taken single file and flew around me and went right straight back into the nest while I was standing there. That's right. Oh, it was God. You see, but before it happened, I have the love. I don't say this to hurt the feeling of the Mexican people who is present. For God knows that I've had some of my best meetings with the Mexican people. I shall never forget the little Spanish choir that used to try to sing Only Believe for me. When Brother Garcia had a church up here somewhere in Phoenix when I first came here, I shall never forget that little familiar glory adios or whatever it is. That they're saying glory to God. And I was down in Mexico a few months ago. And by the way, my next meeting is with the Mexican people on the West Coast. And I was in Mexico, Brother Moore, Brother Brown, Brother Argenbright, and many of the brethren, we were on the platform. And my heart was breaking. Where a little dead baby had been raised from the dead, laying in a mother's arms about at 3 o'clock in the evening at 9 o'clock at night, it raining, and all up and down that platform piled that high was just great big ricks of old shells and everything that they wanted me to pray over. And then who coming to the platform was a poor old dusty-looking Mexican man his hair was gray, and the wrinkles were deep in his face. He was barefooted, and his trousers were ragged off way up. His coat was almost gone. The gray whiskers on his face, and above all that, he was blind. When I seen that poor old man come up to me, and I thought, you know, he'd be just about the age of my dad. I thought how cruel his fate had been to him. The man probably never had a good, decent meal in his life. I put my foot up the side of his to see if my shoes would fit him. I was going to get him my shoes. I looked at his shoulders and he was far wider than I. I was going to give him a coat. And it was too small. Then I happened to think I can't get in my shoes. I can't get in my coat. And how do I know that them old wrinkled hands trying to get a little prayer beads out to run over a prayer bead? And I said, Brother, that's not necessary. You put them back in your pocket. And the interpreter told me. And then... When he come up there, the thing had to do to help the man, you've got to enter into his own suffering.
be with him. The only way to just treat anything good, just be kind to an animal, you'll win it. How much more have you got to be kind, showing brotherly love one to another? And I talked to him, and somehow I just felt how bad the devil was. He had probably had raised a bunch of little kitties in his day, working out there for a few pesos and eating little tortillas maybe made out of old lettuce that had been thrown away for the tourists. And the stuff that was made out of to my heart was breaking. And then to think the devil had him staggered in black darkness. And I just couldn't do no more than that, but embrace that old wrinkled man up to my bosom. And as I looked, he couldn't understand a word I was saying. I said, Heavenly Father, be merciful. Surely if the devil has mistreated him on this, he's a man that you died for. And while I was praying, I heard something horrid glory at the old and I turned him around and his eyes was open. He was walking over the platform, shouting and praising God. What was it? Sympathy. Love. Had been for, he couldn't understand, but he knew I loved him. God knew. Many people said about wild animals, aren't you afraid of it, Brother Branham? Never. I love him. Here some time ago, I served seven years as a conservation officer, a game warden. And one time while I was going up to dig a little ditch to throw some water over to go turn some fish into a stream, we were supposed to pack a little old pistol. And when I, going over across the field, there was a man sick over there that I knew. I was a minister at the time. And I was going over to visit this minister, to have, uh, this man to pray for him. And on my road, I just pulled off this little old gun, sold it up in the car, locked up the door, and stuck out across the field, which is about three quarters of a mile. I had forgotten that in that field was a killer bull that had just killed a colored man down at the birch farm, and they had sold him to Mr. Guernsey on the pasture up there. He was a famous bull, good stock, but was a killer. And I was going out across the field, singing to myself, and I'd come up to a little bunch of scrub, timber, and all of a sudden, out of that scrub timber, raised this big killer bull. And he looked right at me. What was the first thing? I reached for the gun to kill him. I had no gun. I looked for the fence, about 300 yards. He was standing about 20 or 30 yards from me. There was no trees, nowhere to go. It was stand and take your death. So I said, Heavenly Father, I suppose this is the end. And I'm glad I didn't have the gun. I'd have killed the bull and that was the place for him. But I stood to look at the animal. He backed off, snorted, threw his horns down in the dirt, switching his tail. I knew he was coming. And I stood and looked at him a moment, and something happened. Somehow or another, this may seem foolish, but all the fear left when love come in. Fear went away. And I thought the same thing as I did about the bees. I thought, here it is again. And I said to him, the one that created you, I am his servant. 
and I'm on my way to pray for one of these children that's sick. I'm sorry I disturbed you, but in the name of Jesus Christ, go lay down, and I won't bother you. And the boy shook his arms two or three times in the dirt, and here he comes. I wasn't no more afraid than I am right now. Something took place. Now this sounds like a laugh, but it's not for that purpose. Neither is it a joke. For this sacred death is no place for jokes and carrying on. It's the place for the gospel. And the bull, I loved him. I'm sorry that I disturbed him. And he won like straight to me within about ten feet and stopped when he feet up. And he looked to the right and to the left. Looked so depleted. And he turned right around and went over there and laid down and I walked within five feet of him and he never moved his eyes. What is it? It's love. And brother, no matter how much we try to bluff, we're negative without love. Right? Many of you have heard the story of the possum. Leo and Jean, which are my tape boys, they're here, by the way, I guess they're in the pit way up here, they have the tapes of the meetings from everywhere. They come along and take them and let the people have just a little shake over what they have to pay for it, so that the people who have tape recorders can get to them. Other messages everywhere. Very long. And they come up to my house one morning. They call themselves the students. And they come to my house one morning last summer. And they was uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I had the evening paper. And was showing to them a lovely looking colored girl. Who had done a horrible thing in the city. She had given birth to an illegitimate child. And not wanting to keep the child, she had smothered it in some blankets and wrapped some law around it and had a cab driver and take her out over the Ohio River and drop it in the river. The cab driver reported it, and the Coast Guard picked it up and arrested the girl. And while we were sitting there on the porch talking on this hot June morning, Mr. Woods, a friend of mine who lived next door, his wife was that here. They had been over raking in the yard with an old yard rake. And I looked coming down the road, and there come a possum crawling along the road like this. And I lived a third house from the road, from some woods, and I'm the only one that's got a fence around, the parsons. The others are open. And that old possum come right straight down to my gate, turned in. Well, studying wildlife, a possum travels at night time. They're blind in the day. And so I said, look, coming there at that possum, how it's rolling and tumbling, it's probably got rabies. It's been bitten by a fox or something and picked up rabies. I'd better stop it before it gets to the house. And just then the milkman came up. I went out and took the old yard rake and threw over the possum. And I said, and it's sitting, you see, when you touch them, they'll do what they call playing possum. They'll tie it over. But instead of that, she kept fighting to get away. Well, I happened to notice then, and Leo and Jean came out, the boys here, and I noticed that the old possum's leg on the left side was swollen about three times the size, and it was broken, hanging back, and I hope I do not turn your stomach, but it was rotten, the flies had bloated, maggots was all in it, and it was hanging sideways, and I said, oh, it's hurt. The dog just broke its leg, 
or either a car has hit it. I said it's dying. I said it's probably in life struggle. And some of the neighbors come over to look. And Mrs. Woods is one. She come up. And while I was holding the possum down, I happened to notice that a possum and a kangaroo is the only animals that have a pocket to pack their young in. And they have a pocket, a skin that goes over the young, and they pack them and they let it down. So when the old mother possum had been under this race, she let her pocket down, and nine little bitty baby possums about that long was running around under the race. Now I said, here you are, boys, the Leo and I said, this possum is far more a lady and a mother than that woman was that granted her baby. It's got better morals than that woman has. I said that woman didn't want her baby, and this old possum hasn't got maybe 30 minutes longer to live, but she'll give that 30 minutes or forfeit her life to fight for those babies. That's a real mother. And how these women today that have fortunate cases and practice birth control and everything else, and I don't understand it. Take little babies and throw them in garbage cans and put them on steps, drown them in rivers and throw them in bars. It's below our animal. An animal wouldn't do that. And while we were talking, the old possum still trying to get those young ones up. And when the little ones caught up again, she kept biting at the race. I said, watch her go to turn her loose. She won't go the little piece of time. That's what you're running her death, I said. A running her. And then when I left up the race, she took off towards the house, dragging this foot. And she went right up to my step to the side of a little evergreen bush and there collapsed and went out. I went up to her. I shook her. And she didn't move. I said, I guess she's dying. And I happened to look at all those little baby possums were trying to nurse. And I said, what a pity. I took the red hand and punched the old possum. I seen that little green light on it. It goes back on the possum. I said, no, she's a living. And Miss Wood said, Brother Branham, now there's only one thing to do. She's a doctor, Ventner. She said, kills the old mother. The little ones has a round mouth. They can't be raised. And then just pick up the little ones and kill them quickly so they won't suffer. I said, I just can't do it. And she said, do you mean to tell me that you're going to let that mother lay there and die in that bed and them poor little possums nurse around for about 48 hours and die in that condition? Do you mean you're going to do that, Brother Branham? I said, Sister Woods, you're perhaps right, but I just can't do it. She's done this play to me something that's far beyond what a lot of people have. She's a real mother. I said, I can't kill that mother. She said, well, go in and get your gun and shoot her then and shoot the little one. said, you're a hunter. I said, I am a hunter, but I'm not a killer. I said, I can't kill that mother. And she said, you're going to let her lay there in that hot sun. We got some water and pulled over. Look how she was gone. Well, I wouldn't let him kill her. Jeannie and the old left. The old possum lay there all day in that hot sun and the more green flies all over. It come night and Mr. Wood said, now, Billy, you've been working hard all day here, praying for the sick. I'm going to take that little ride. So he took his wife and my wife and I. And we went out a little ride, and coming down a country road, I seen a little pup, somebody had dropped out on the road. 
And I got up and picked that little cup up, and he was so mangy and lice all over him, so my hands were covered with lice. Well, I sticked him in a little place to put him in my car, and my wife said, <laughs> she said, Billy, you're not going to take that little old mangy dog. I said, sure, he's got a right to live. And we went home, prayed for him, and got all that, washed him up. He's a fine big collie dog now. He's got a right to live. I love him. When we got in at 11 o'clock, there lay the old possum, Brother Woods, who hunts with me, said, now, Billy, he know good and well. If that possum was going to move when that sun went down, she'd have moved. I said, that's right. Well, I said, you want me to kill her? I said, no, I don't. All night long, I couldn't get that possum off my mind. The next morning early, I went out, and as I saw that little Rebecca, who I believe is going to maybe take my place someday, she see her first vision just recently, and she's a very tender-hearted little thing. When I went out on the porch about 7 o'clock, the sun was rising to see if there's anybody out there. And it was not, and first thing you know, by my side was little Rebecca. She said, Daddy, what about the old possum? I just dreamed of her all night. Well, I went down there, and there laid the old possum, dew all over it, and the little one's still trying to nurse. Oh, I said, she's probably dead, honey. She said, Daddy, what you going to do with them little babies? You're going to kill them? I said, no, honey, I'm not. I said, you hurry in the house. It's too early for you to get up. I said, you go on, she had on pajamas. I said, you go on the house, honey. And I went back into the side door of the den room. And I sat down there and began to rub my face like this. I said, well, today, I said, I guess I'll have to take some one of that old possum laying there. I heard something say this. Now, you may think I'm mentally disturbed. But I heard something speaking to me. I said, what about that old possum? And the boy said, you used her for a text yesterday, telling what a wonderful mother she was. I said, that's true. Said, and you taught from her what a real mother. Yes. Said, I sent her up to your door, and she waited for 24 hours for her turn to be prayed for, and you haven't said one thing. And I said, well, I didn't. I thought, who am I talking to? Oh, I said, am I beside myself? What's happened? Who was that I was talking to? I thought it must have been God. I thought, would God care for that animal? I know he sent people. But I remember that he even said a little sparrow can't fall to the ground without your heavenly Father knowing it. I know he spoke to a mule, to a man, once and many things in the Bible. I went out to the old possum where she was laying, and I said, Heavenly Father, you forgive me if the, I was so tucked up with things of the day so I never understood. And if you sent that dumb animal who did not have any soul but was guided by instinct to come to my door to be prayed for so she could live and raise her baby. Forgive me, Lord, and I pray that in Jesus' name that you'll help her. Brother, sister, when I meet you at the judgment, this will be ringing out. Little Becky was standing there looking down. That old mother possum raised up picked up her nine little babies, stuck that tail right up in the air, walked right down that driveway, just as free as it could be. When she got to the end of the road, she turned around and Becky had her arms around me and me and my arms around Becky crying. And she turned around and used to say, Thank you, sir. And right down to the wood she went, and as far as I know, she's happy with her babies over there in that wood today. When divine love is projected 
and it comes to the end of its course, sovereign grace will stand in and take its place. Brother, sister, if God, that possum no more about divine healing and half the preachers of Phoenix knows. That's right. She had gumption enough to follow the leading of the Spirit. And if God could send a possum by divine grace and love to protect her babies, how much more will he think of you and me tonight if we'll give him our whole heart of love? Our surrender will everything to him. He will project to us. His sovereign grace will have to take place and heal if you'll give him that love. The world is wanting to see some more of that. The world is longing for that. To see that love. You're much more than a possum. You're more than any animal. But sometimes God can deal with an animal who can't act for itself before he can get to a stony heart who is on a free moral agency base who can act according to the way you wish. Let us bow our heads just a moment. Oh God, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but would have eternal life. To thee we give thanks and praise, thou who knoweth all things. How many stories could we tell of your great love and grace that thou hast done for us? And we thank thee for it. And in this audience tonight, O oh God, may the sinner man, boy, or woman or girl, who has been divinely led to this place of worship tonight, let them know right now that it is your Spirit that has led them here for no other purpose but to come and serve you. Oh, speak to their hearts just now, and may they send forth from their heart the divine love of God in appreciations of you leading them here, and sovereign grace will send a message back the saving message of the Lord. Thy sins may be as scarlet, now they are white as snow. Grant it, Father, for we ask it in His name. And while we have our heads bound in prayer, I just wonder this, friend, while we have been speaking or either before you come to church or last week or month or year, has something been speaking to your heart? What caused you, Mr. or Mrs., to come to the meeting tonight? It was the same God that stopped the animals in the field. It's the same one who led the old mother possum who's done all the things that's love. God so loves you that he's led you to a place where you could accept him. Will you do it? Upon the basis of the shed blood of his beloved son, that God could not do nothing else, but it, his great love constrained him in such a way that he could not do nothing else. Grace had to send you a Savior. And now if your love to God will be the same way that His love was to send Jesus, your love will draw Jesus to you, and you can be saved. If you would like to accept Christ and be remembered in prayer, would you raise your hands now anywhere on the bottom floor? 
would say, by the grace of God, I put up my hands and say, God, lead me through life and in death like you do others, like we have been told tonight. God bless you, sir. Someone else on the bottom floor, raise your hand. God bless you. Someone else, just raise your hand. Christians, pray you will. God bless you back there in the bank. I see your hand. Someone else. I put up my hands. God bless you up there, Sonny. That's good. Up in the balcony to my left. Put up, God bless you, lady. God bless you. God bless you. Someone else. God bless you, Sonny. Someone back in the balcony to the rear. Would you put up your hands? Say, Brother Brandon, pray for me. I want God to help me. God bless you back there. I see your hands, and surely God does. God bless you here, Sonny. God, God bless you, sister. Certainly. To the balcony to the right. Put up your hand and say, Brother Branham, pray for me. I really want Christ. God bless you, young man. God bless you up there, young fellow, again. God bless you over there, young man. God bless you. All right, someone else? Back to the rear. God bless you up there, my brother. That's good. Anywhere in the building, someone else. Now, before we close, God bless you, sir. Someone else. That's right. Put up your... God bless you, lady. God, God bless you, lady. With someone else? I now want God to be... God bless you, lady. God bless you, lady. God bless you, too, and you. That's right. You say, Brother Branham, does that mean anything? It certainly does. It means a difference between an eternal separation from God or an eternal presence of God. When you raise your hand, that means that something in you, you have power within you to break every law of science break, move, gravitation, and something within you makes a choice and you stick up your hand, what does that do? That shows an exception of the divine love of Christ. Something in you calls you to raise your hand. And the Bible said, God bless you, lady. Yes, God bless you back there. God bless you, sisters. A little Spanish ladies up in the balcony to the rear. I see you. What is it? God so loved you. His love was so great for you. So His love projected a Savior for you. He so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son. And here's the Holy Spirit you're leading in. The Bible said, No man can come to me, said Jesus, except my Father draws him first. God bless you, the Spanish lady sitting here. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, then what do you do? Something inside you, an immortal something, says, I am speaking to my child of mine. And you put up your hand, you break every law of science. Yes, Father, I raise my hand in recognition of your voice. You're calling. Jesus said, All the Father has given me will come to me, and no man can take them from my hand. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that set me has eternal life and shall never come into the judgment but pass from death to life. Would there be another while I comb the meeting over? Just raise your hands to Christ. God bless you there, brother. God bless you too. All right. Down on the main floor here to the left. Can we go around now and just see someone else who hasn't raised their hand? God bless you there, sir. God bless you, sir. That's good. Balconies to the rear. Again, someone who hasn't raised their hand. Balconies to the left. Put a comb at once more. God bless you, lady. God be with you. Someone else. All right. Right down here, God bless you. God bless you, lady up there. Down here to the main floor, again, once more around to the left now. God bless you and you and you. Yes, and you and you, brothers. God bless you all. Yes. Someone else, just, just, just pray this. If God speaks to your heart, say, Would you think, my brethren, these little stories which are amateur, how I could tell you things that I know he's done that would startle you? When my life has been a mysterious one, it's true, people don't understand, but it's been that I love Him. When God seems fit to take my life, baby, and everything I have, they never thought of my little baby when it's, I, my wife was a cop, 
And my little baby started dying. I run down into the hospital and fell down before God. I said, God, don't take my little darling. Don't do it, Lord. And I looked in front of me in a black sheet letting down. I know he was going to take her. Then Satan spoke to me. He said, Younger, in the Lord lays your wife, 23 years old. Here's your nine-month-old baby, and he's taken that. You mean you'll serve him? Then I looked down. I said, Though he slay me, yet I'll serve him. For there was something happened down here in my bosom that made a love for him that the Bible said there's nothing present, neither trials or nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. If he would send me to torment at the day of the judgment, he's still just. And if I have the mind that I have now, while I'm in hell, I'll still love him. It's part of me. That's what it is. That's what it is to you, friend, It loves the Lord. That's what I want him to be, a part of you. Love. Now, as we bow our heads, let us pray. Heavenly Father, I would not know how to say how many in this audience has raised their hands to you. What are they, Father? They are your love gift that you're giving to Jesus, your Son. No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that come, I'll give them eternal life. And no man can pluck them from my hand. They are God's love gift. And, O oh Lord Jesus, as a minister of yours, an unworthy and unprofitable servant, I now give you the fruit of this message. Each has raised their hands, put their name on the book of life. Thou hast promised to do it and raise them up at the last day. Now that they have accepted you, heard your word, and believed on you, they are born again and have eternal life. Now, Father God, I pray that you will baptize them with the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ as believers. Set these young men and women into the field of service, the old and young alike, Oh, we are needing recruits for this great army, and someday you'll make your last call, and it'll all be over. Grant, Lord, that each one that raised their hands tonight, and many of those who sh could have raised their hands, maybe and did not, I pray that they will be your children, and you'll be with them through life, and someday... When my voice on your great radar screen vibrates this sermon again at the end of the world, may on that great screen you'll see their hands and know their name. Janet, Lord, that the Spirit for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you, my dear friend. You know what? You've received eternal life. Now I'm going to see if Billy gives out any prayer cards. If you do, we have prayer line. If we don't, I'm going to make the order call. Could you give out prayer cards? Mm -hmm. What was it? H's? Under 100? You give out prayer cards. I want to ask you something. Everyone that raised your hands, I don't know how long the prayer line will run, but will you do this for the glory of God? When the service is over, I want you to walk right down here and offer a word of thanksgiving to God for calling. You know that's one of the most marvelous things there is? 
Perhaps there'll be cancers healed, deaf or dumb, or maybe cripples walk. That'll be wonderful, but never as wonderful as what you've just received. They'll get sick again. But you've got eternal life. I want you to come down, promise me and God, or God and I, rather, that you'll come down and pray at the end of the service. Now, how many has never been in one of my meetings? Let's see your hand. There's many. Now, I want you to know you're probably of all different denominations and churches. But here we don't represent any denomination. We only try to represent our blessed Lord. Who you love and who your church preaches about and talks about. And we're not trying to make disciples out of anyone. We are only trying to get you to fall deeply in love with the Lord Jesus and start winning souls for Him. Now, in the prayer line, I do not claim to be a healer or have any power to heal anyone. Neither do I believe that any person has power to heal but God. I believe there never was a hospital, doctor, operation, or anything ever healed anyone. I believe that a doctor is sent on earth by God. I believe a doctor, when he breaks your arm, can set your arm. He cannot heal it. He can put it in a place where God can heal it. A doctor can remove a tumor, a appendix, or a tooth. But who's going to heal the place where it was taken away from? That's moving and destruction. Who's going to heal the place? Only God alone. Now, if the Lord willing, we're starting tomorrow night on God and His Word. And God said in His Word, I'm the Lord who heals all your diseases. And there never was a medicine, never was an operation, never was a divine healer, never was anyone else that ever could create and build cells but God alone. The devil can't do it. The devil can't create. He can only pervert what God has created. It's the devil that gives you the tumor, perverts the cell, see? He can't not create a cell. He can pervert one if he can get his life into it. But he cannot create nothing. So I claim that God, not me, but the Bible says that God has set in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors, therefore the perfecting of the church. Now, I'm not a preacher, as you know, and no one knows any better than I do. And I'm not a preacher to preach. My, my work is to pray for God's sick children by seeing vision. And it's the work of the Lord Jesus. Preaching is the work of the Lord Jesus. Vans pastors, all the work of the Lord Jesus. We have a lot of impersonators, but there's really a real one, too. Now, notice, when Jesus was here on earth, did he claim to be a healer? No, sir. He said, it's not me that doeth the work, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. He said in St. John 5, 19, think of it, a handful in 2008. When you go home, read it, the whole chapter of St. John. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. A Jew came to him, and he said, well, you're a believer. Behold. This Israelite, in whom is no guile, he said, When did you know me, Rabbi? He said, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the tree. He said, How many knows that's true? St. John 1. Certainly. That Jew said, Thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel. He said, Because I told you this, you believe? Now he was probably 30 miles around the mountain where he found him the day before. But here he was over here. He believed. The woman at the well. He went up, he was on his road to Jericho, down below Jerusalem. He had to go through Samaria, up around Samaria. He sent his disciples away, a woman of ill fame, come out to get some water. He, she was a Samaritan, not a Jew now. I remember that when he did that to the Jew, the Jew said, that's the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel. Now here comes the Samaritan now. And Jesus said, woman, bring me a drink. She said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask us Samaritans such. We have no such custom. In other words, it was a segregation, like in the South, the white and colored. But 
Jesus let her know there was no difference in the presence of God. He said, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And the conversation went on at length. Finally, Jesus found out what that woman's trouble was. The Father sent him up there. The Father sent me here. Now, he didn't know the woman. He'd never seen her. But he was contacting her spirit. And he said to her when he found her trouble, he said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right, you got five. And you're living with one now that's not your husband. So in that thou set us right. Watch what the woman said. Now, she's a Samaritan, seemingly a cold, formal believer. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She said, We know, we Samaritans, we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll do that. He'll tell us things to come. But said, Who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? If that was the sign of the Messiah in them days, and the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's got to be the same sign tonight of Messiah. We haven't room or time to talk much more. Let's believe. Father God, I now commit myself in this service to you. I have spoken at length of thee. Speak, O God. One word from you will be more than I could speak in a many lifetimes. Let thy Holy Spirit speak tonight and do those things that you promised, and all praise shall be thine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, what was that? H. All right. We can't stand too many times. Uh, H number one, two, three, four, five. Just line yourself up over here now. Now watch, look at your neighbors and see if they got, if they can hear. Look at the prayer cards and see where they're at. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's them line. While they're coming, let's pray for these neighbors. Almighty God, in whom we believe and trust, let thy mercies rain upon these handkerchiefs. Show great signs and wonders by healing the sick. I send them to the sick and the needy. In the name of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, who so loved us. Amen. Now, some of you anoint handkerchiefs. And, but if you watch the Bible, Acts 19, Paul didn't anoint him. That's all right. Anoint him, that's okay. But Paul didn't anoint him. just they taken from his body handkerchiefs and aprons. All right, five did I say, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. H, H, one to fifteen. Let those get in line. And now I want, while they're coming, I want you to look this way. All right. And if uh, some of them will go down, I guess some of them are helping. Now I want to ask you something. If the Lord Jesus, who we have spoken of, of his love, who loves animals, who loves people, who loves you in your sin, who loves you in your differences, who loves you in your sickness, and if the Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he will come to this platform in the midst of these people, and will reproduce his life by the same works that he did when he was on earth, will you all accept him with one accord for anything you have need of? Will you do it or not? Now, you little children who have just come to Christ tonight, see whether you're serving if you accepted a dead Christ or a live one. He is alive forevermore. Now, let's see. Are you still on? All right. All right just a minute. We seem to get quietened down over here. How many doesn't have prayer cards? Let's see you raise your hand. All right. You look and live, look and... Does the Bible say, in the Bible, that Jesus is going down to a group of people, and a little woman touched his garment, and he turned around and said, Who touched me? Now, we know the Palestinian garment hangs loose, and it has an underneath garment, and he couldn't have touched her physical... Uh, her, felt her physical touch. She touched his garment, and went over somewhere and stood up in the crowd. 
Jesus turned and said, Who touched me? Peter rebuked him and said, The whole crowd touched you. Why say, Who touched me? Every one of them denied it. She denied it. But Jesus was endued with the power. So he looked around. Until he found what was wrong. And he found the little woman. And he said, Thy faith has saved thee. Is that right? Well, is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? Does the Bible say that right now he's a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities? Then you look and live. Believe him. Then let him vindicate it. Now, he doesn't have any hands on earth but mine and yours. He doesn't have any eyes but mine and yours. He has no mouth but mine and yours. But he wants us to yield what we got to him as a branch, and he's the vine that shoves forth the energy. The vine doesn't bear fruit, does it? The branch bears fruit. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Now, we are to bear the fruit of his ministry until he comes. The Bible said, Jesus did, a little while and the world will see me no more. That's when he physically left. They'll never know it no more. Now, that's the world. The world will see me no more for all. It's gone. Yet ye shall see me, ye, that's the believer, for I'll be with you, how long? To the end of the world. Is that right? I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Now, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let us be reverent and pray. Now, now if you will, I'm going to ask you for just a few moments, maybe say 15 minutes, if you'll be real quiet. Now, we've heard the message. The sinners have accepted Christ. Surely we found favor with him. Now, what's next, Brother Branham? All right? It was God who led those sinners to him all around. It's God. Now, what do you do now, Brother Branham? Yield myself to the Spirit. And by divine gift, I'll yet just yield myself to his Spirit. He takes over. He does the work. Not me. It's not my words that's speaking. It may be my voice. But it's his power speaking to that voice, just like the mule, or like the prophets, or anything that God takes over, he uses it. Now, here's a man from here. Now, here stands the man tonight, and so far as I know, both of us are strangers to each other. If that's right, raise up your hand. Now, I do not know the man. He does not know me. If I come here and said, I'll put my hands on you, hallelujah, you're going to get well. Now, he has right to kind of, well, I hope I do. But, if I say, oh, in another six months, you're needing finances. That's what you come to ask God. You've got a little family to starve in. And you want finances. Day after tomorrow, you're going to get them. Well, you'd have right to, well, I, maybe I will. Or if he wants prayer for somebody else, or they're going to get it. Well, you'd have a right to kind of doubt that. But if the Holy Spirit will go down into his life, like he did Philip. Now, the man may be a critic, he may be an infidel, he may be a Christian. I don't know. I've never seen the man. But whatever he is, watch what the Holy Spirit will tell about. And then if the Holy Spirit will tell him something that has been, surely he'll know whether that's true or not. Then if he tells him what has been, he'd have faith to believe what will be. Is that right? Then he'll be the judge of that. And that would be just the same thing that Jesus did when he was here on earth. Now, look, this is a man. There was a man came to the Lord Jesus, a good man, 
And Jesus said, Behold an Israelite. Now they all dressed alike. He could have not been an Israelite. He could have been a Greek or something else. But Jesus knew he was an Israelite, a good, honest man. And so it kind of astonished him. He said, When did you know me, Rabbi, our reverend teacher? He said, Before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. What I, 30 miles around the mountain the day before. First time he'd ever saw him. And the man looked at him and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Jesus said, because I told you that, see, that was the sign of the Messiah. Now, whether he will or not, I don't know. I can't say that. That goes to God alone. But if you'll be real reverent, and we'll trust God to do it. Just think, if he does do it, why it ought to electrify this city. How can we sit so gross and groggy and know that the living Christ is in our midst? Shows there's something wrong. Right. I'll be real reverend. Let me talk to the man. Now, sir, I see you have a sign on you that said personal worker. All right? Now, if we do not know each other, and the Lord Jesus will tell me, what you're here to ask him. To come ask me something wouldn't do much good because I have, if it be money, I might have two or three dollars to let you have. But I'd do that if you want it. I'd give you everything I have if I could help you. But if you're wanting healing or wanting something else, might be something I couldn't do for you. But you know what you want, and if you know what you want and what you need, he's able to tell me like he told the woman at the well. Is that right? If he'll do it, will you receive it? Will the audience receive it? Believe it. Now, here's the place where I'm either found to be the truth or a lie. Either the truth or it's it's a lie. And remember, it's nothing I can do within myself. It's God permitting it to be done. And all knows that. By divine gift. May he grant it. I'll be just quiet. Don't move around. See, when the Spirit wants to take the whole, each one of your spirits, you know that. If you wouldn't, you'd be dead. So it's your spirit, see, that I catch. And when it is, if you'll just pray, just sit still, don't move around, just pray and say, God, be merciful to me. Look what he does through the night, everywhere in the audience, people. Is that right? Way more in the audience than he is up here. Many don't even sit down about the letters pour in and things. How they go to doctors and everything. How they tell them, it's over. Just have faith, believe. Now, if I could help you and wouldn't, I'd be a cruel person. But I can't help you, but God can. If God will let me know what you want from Him, then you'll believe Him, believe me to be His servant. If the audience can still hear my voice, I see the man walking. It's in the floor. And his trouble is up in here around his eyes or head. It's a, it's a sinus trouble. I see him rubbing up in here, kind of in this way, it's sinus. And you've got something wrong with your side. That's right. And you've had an operation. And that operation is the cause of your side being that way. That's right. Now, do you believe that the truth? You believe? And let's pray. I'm Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that your mercies will be shed to this man. 
by the Holy Ghost, and may he be healed through Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, brother. Over now, go rejoicing, be happy. How do you do, ladies? Would I be a hypocrite to stand here before the sacred death? If I could help you, you know how to do it. See, your hair is gray, and those hands have probably done a many days' work. And here you stand tonight, wanting something from God. If I could help you, I'd do it. But the only thing I can do is preach the Word the best that I can, and then by divine gift, help you if I can. I see you at the house, a place, and you're fixing a table, and it's uh, something about when you're eating. It's your stomach. You got stomach trouble, right? And then you've got a growth. That growth from the side. That's right, isn't it? Raise your hand if that's right. Now he who knows you, and you know I don't. Do you believe that he'll make you well? If I'll ask him, there's something here that's got me anointed. You know that, huh? You know that. What do you think it is? You think it's God? Well, then God said this, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. You believe it? Our Heavenly Father, I lay hands upon this woman and ask for her to be healed in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I go believe you. Don't doubt with all your heart. God bless you. What do you think? Sitting there praying, aren't you? If I tell you what you're praying about, would you believe me to be God's prophet? It's about your back. That's right, isn't it? That's right, raise up your hand. All right, it's over now. You go home, be well. Your faith touched something, didn't it? Or it touched Christ. Now have faith and believe. I challenge this audience in the name of Christ, to look this way and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look and live. Don't doubt, but have faith. All right, little lady, bitch, you're sitting there praying like that. Because I spoke of his back, you had back trouble, too. That's right. That's right. You had sinus also. That's right, is it? You was right there praying, Lord, let it be me tonight. Is that right? All right, you got it now. You touched him. See what I mean? Look and believe. The Bible said, look and live. You believing? What do you think sitting there with your hand back on? You believe? You're praying too, aren't you? You believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has sent me to do this? You do? All right, you got skin trouble, haven't you? Is that right? Raise your hand. You believe you're healed? All right, go home and be well in Christ's name. Do you believe? Now, lady, I guess I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you never see me. But God does know you. Isn't that right? I have faith in If God will reveal to me what you are here for, you believe it? I see the reason you don't. I could talk to you a long time. He'd keep telling you more and more I talk, as much as I would show me. See? But contacting your spirit, see? That's what brings it.
been sick this week, haven't you? Frankly, you've been in bed all week. That's right. You've had hemorrhages. That's right. You've got colitis in the bowels, haven't you? Your name is Miss Reynolds, isn't it? And you live at 2010 Henshaw. Now go on back up there and be over it and get well in the name of the Lord Jesus. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. All right, lady, we're strangers to each other. I don't know you, never seen you. Don't know nothing about you. But there's someone here who does know you. If he will reveal himself, will you believe his resurrection? Now look, you're aware that something's going on, aren't you? And you know you wouldn't feel that way because of me standing here. That light settled over you. See, that's what makes it real. Now you're suffering with an extreme nervous condition, which is caused by the time of life you're living. And you have something wrong in your chest. And you have something wrong in your stomach. That's right. And you have a growth on your leg. Not, right? That's right. Now, do you believe me to be his prophet? I mean his servant? That word stumbles the public. You do? Then I surely need to help you. You've got someone else you're praying for. And that's a grandchild, granddaughter, granddaughter. And she's got a growth on the knee. And she don't live in this country. She lives in a flat country, in the eastern country. It's in Ohio. Exactly right. Just a moment. Just a moment, lady. A man sitting right down here. A missionary preacher. His wife sitting next to him praying for a headache condition. It's something about Ohio with you. I don't know you. I've never seen you. But it's someone who's close to you that was healed in my meeting in Ohio of TB. It's a little boy and his mother's been prayed for for the same. That's thus saith the law. All right, go on your road rejoicing. You can have what you ask for, lady. God be merciful to you. Oh, do you now believe? Now, sir, I don't know you. You know that. I don't know you, but God does know you. Let me have your hand just a moment. You got ulcers. It's right. Correctly. You believe me to be God's prophet? You would. You're doing something that's making those ulcers worse. The back will ruin them. Make you worse than ever. You believe God will take that cigarette away from you and make you... Will you surrender that cigarette in your life to Christ right now? You will? Then may the God of heaven take away the iniquity and heal this man in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Go on your road rejoicing, sir. Join some real good church and make...
Don't move, friend. Just step still. See? If something happened, I've seen a hospital. It's an old woman. And she's in a, a mental hospital. It's that woman's mother sitting right there. She's praying for her mother. And if you believe that God will heal her, the Lord grant it to you, sister. God can heal cancer or anything else and make you well. You believe he can make that cancer leave you? Then I condemn it in the name of Jesus Christ. May it go from you. Amen. Have faith in God. How did you do, sir? Those wearisome coughing hours. As that condition is a horrible thing. But do you believe Christ can make you well? You do? Our Heavenly Father, I bless this man in the name of Jesus Christ. May he be well. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Go and be made well. My sister, God can heal heart trouble as same as anything else. You believe he'll make you well of heart trouble without asking? It's a nervous heart, that's what it is. You have worse when you lay down. See? I see you laying down. It's another gas, really, what he'll cause push up against the heart. Oh, God of heaven, settle the nerves of this poor little woman and make her well in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, sister. Have faith. Strange, when I said that to her, something happened to you, didn't it? This is the same thing. You both are healed at the same time. We're just going over the platform rejoicing. Same thing. Keep it on. Come, lady. The lady coming has a black shadow following her. Shadow of death, which is cancer. You believe God will heal you, lady, and make you well? Amen. Our kind heavenly Father, as my own strength is fading away, I pray for this woman. Or if you could heal a possum, how much more can you make this saint well? I condemn this spirit of death on her and ask that she lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Go happy to her. Rejoice in you. got a stomach condition. Nervous because you have dyspepsy like the belching up of the food and stuff that goes into your stomach. Do you believe that God will make you well? Will you accept him now as your healer? Oh, eternal God, in Jesus Christ's name, I condemn the devil that's harming my sister. And ask that he leaves her. In Christ's name, amen. Have faith in God. Do you believe everyone? With all your heart you believe? Oh, hour after hour, this can happen. Well, what does it confirm? Jesus Christ alive. Jesus is here. What do you think of a little lady looking at me? There was female trouble right back there in the back of the audience. Do you believe that God will make you well? Do you believe it with all your heart? If you believe it, all right. You can have it. The Lord bless you. What do you think about it? Rest of you. Do you believe with all your heart? Do you believe God will heal you now? I tell you, friend, look at you. I'm just a weak. I can hardly stand you. Right? And the whole room just looks like kind of a, a... I know you don't call me a fanatic. Surely you don't. If one little woman touching him made virtue go from him, what is that the Son of God? What about me, a sinner? Saved by grace. And what's doing these visions? Not me. It's you. It's your faith of touching him and he's answering back. Do you understand? Do you believe he's alive? Do you believe he's here to heal you? Then why not accept him? I wonder right here while we're standing, how many of you are convinced that the Lord Jesus is here? Raise up your hand. Now I'm going to ask for those, just a minute while we stop the line a minute, those who raised their hand along with those who did not raise their hand, I want you to come here just a minute. While the anointing is here with me, I, I, I want you to come here. I want you to come here. To, I want to pray for you. You sinners that raise your hand, I want you to come. The sinners coming seeking salvation, I want you to come to the altar right here now. Come down out of the balconies, everyone. 
when you come right now, I want you to stand here while we pray for your soul, which is far more than your physical healing. Won't you come? God bless this poor old man coming on crutches. Sir, come and give your heart to him. You can walk away without your crutches. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And that thou bid me come here, O Lamb of God. Uh, that's right. Come right down out of the balcony. Come right here now. You say, Brother Branham, why do you stop the prayer line early? Because I'm seeking the lost. That's it. I want you to come now. Move right on down. That's right. Give them room back there. Come right down. Stand here a minute. I won't come here and pray with you. That's it. Come right on down this way. Move yourself right down here. Blood washes for I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to lead you down here. I see a little colored girl come down standing here, little red dress on, little white ribbon in her hair. There was a little girl taken captive one time, and she said to her master, I would to God that you were over in my country. There's a prophet over there that could recover you and heal you of that leprosy. How that little girl given testimony to her faith in the prophet calls an immortal story to be wrote in the Bible. Will you come just now? Now, come right on. You that are needing Christ, you that have the spiritual need of Christ, won't you come? I believe there were more hands in this that went up. I want you to come right on. on. Won't you do it? I'm persuading you now. Here some time ago, you might have heard a little story. It was some time ago. There was a, a man standing in a court being tried. And while he was being tried, he said to the judge, the judge found him guilty, and said, I sentence you to hang by your neck until your mortal, mortal life is gone. And the man went up and he said, Judge, don't you know me? He said, No, I don't. He said, One day when I was a little boy, I was laying in a wagon. You were a young man then, Judge. Someone shot a gun down the street. The horses run away, and we're going to run over a big bluff. And you rushed in front of the horses and grabbed them and drove the hide from your feet until you stopped those horses and saved my life said, Judge, I'm that same boy. Save me again, Judge. He said, Young man, that day I was your Savior. Today I'm your Judge. That might be said to you. Tonight he's the, your Savior. In the morning he may be your Judge. Won't you come while we sing once more? Just as I and wait not till my soul from one dark light to him whose blood. And you're here to thank God for his goodness to you. Now we're going to bow our heads to pray.
all over the building, everywhere. Merciful Father, be kind now. And I pray for each of these who are standing here, that they may be touched by thy divine power. I pray that you will give to them the forgiveness of all their sins. Grant it, Lord. And I know you will. You promised you would. And we now present them to Christ. That God has called them to this altar of repentance. And they have accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. And they're standing here as a testimony to the people that they have accepted Christ as personal Savior. Now, God, I pray that you will baptize them into the body of the Lord Jesus by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And these, your trained servants, instructing, who can stand here and make known to them this great revelation, I pray that they will receive the Holy Ghost this night. Grant it, Lord. Bless all who is in divine presence. This lady standing here waiting for her healing. I lay hands on her and ask that you'll heal her in Christ's name. I ask that you'll heal each one, everybody that's here, every sick person. Oh, Satan, you know you're going to lose the battle. Christ defeated you at Calvary. You have no power. You were stripped of everything you had, and all you are is a big bluff. And we're calling your hand on that bluff in Jesus Christ's name. Get out of this building. Come out of the people and go from here. And may the spirit of doubt and superstition leave this building for the God of heaven who raised up his son Christ Jesus, who is present right now to heal every sick person and to pour out the baptism of the Holy Ghost on the people. Grant it, God, in Jesus' name. Now, while we have our heads bowed, everyone praying, believing, now you here seeking the Holy Ghost, I want you to raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. You want God to fill you the Holy Ghost. All that wants the baptism of the Holy Ghost, raise up your hand. Now that I'm tired and I'm weak and weary, I'm going to ask our brother Ballard, a Christian minister, to continue this prayer. So personal workers, lay hands on these people now. Lay your hands on them. Somebody out there that's got the Holy Ghost, lay your hands on those that's got their hands up. And now for a great one unity, a great blast of the power of God, may you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and be healed in Jesus.